Welcome to the Hidden Bookcase. Come through and get cozy. Pick a book, your favorite book, that's the one that opens this room. Inside you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a dangerously high to be red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they them pronouns, and I am none houses with left grief. I'm Soren, I use he him pronouns, and I have a mystery too boring to solve. I'm Zoe, I use he they pronouns, and I'm a polycule that somehow only involves the physical forms of two people. Soren and I have been friends for over a decade, and the two of us are always swapping books. Each fortnight, the two of us, sometimes with help from a friend, take it in turns to recommend one another a favourite read. The first time reader tells us what they know about the book, makes some predictions about what they don't, and then we discuss our thoughts with all of you bookworms. On our shelf this month is sequels. So today, let's get to talking about... Arrow the Ninth by Tamsin Moore. So you guys have a very difficult task now <laughs> of telling me what it's about. Oh. I'm going to throw you both in the deep end. <sighs> What is Harrow about? What is Harrow about? So it's the sequel to Gideon the Ninth, where a girl, Harrow Harkonnen Jesimus, finds herself on God's epic swinger yacht, also known as the Mithraeum, <laughs> and she's plotting his murder. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but this is spoilers. <laughs> oh, no, I was just wondering if I was allowed to say swinger yacht on the podcast. Oh, of course. <laughs> Okay. We've read Borderline Erotica. We've done the Freya Lost books. It's yeah, fine. this is arguably Borderline Erotica. So yeah. Good, so. <laughs> Do you have anything to add to that, Morgan? It's about losing your mind. It's about love. It's so about love. It's about self hatred. It's about literally. I love this book so much. Me too. That it's so hard to talk about. Mm-hmm. It's written in second person. My absolute beloved all time favorite tense. Literally, Soren and I, when we were teenagers, used to like look up books written in second person because we were so happy fixated on it. Couldn't find anything decent, but now. But now. Do we do my blind? Because I feel like if we start talking, we're not going to stop. Yes. No, let's do your blind. Okay, Harry the Ninth. I feel like I somehow know less about it than Gideon the Ninth, so here's what I do know. Harrow point of view. I think it's in second person, or I think it's at least partially in second person, just because Morgan and I have a mild obsession with second person, and I remember in discussion about how few novels, particularly in science fiction and fantasy, are in second person, Harrow came up. I'm not sure if it's the entire thing or if it's just used occasionally for effect, but I'm very, very excited about that aspect of it. I think Harrow and Gideon sharing mind space is going to be a bit of a thing. Like, I've maybe seen a couple of sort of meme fan art things that imply that. Uh, at some point we're getting non-pizza with left beef. I'm pretty sure that's in Harrow because people have been talking about that since pre-Nona, so looking forward to that. And Ianthe, Ianthe, struggling with coming to terms with um, using a prosthetic arm after losing her arm. And Harrow struggling with mental health. And also um, I saw a graph about how often Gideon's name gets mentioned and it seems like it's flatlined for most of the book and then in the last couple of chapters it suddenly skyrockets. So not sure what's going on there. Maybe Harrow isn't originally aware that Gideon is in the, the the passenger seat, something like that. Maybe trying to repress thinking about her. I don't know, but very, very much looking forward to it. Incredibly excited. <laughs> I meant that less literally. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> obviously at the beginning she's like Autis, and I was like, are you lying? And then I was like, oh, she's not lying. Yeah, because I read this like so long after I first read Gideon, so I thought I was just stupid and forgot everything that happened. But no, it just gaslights you for the whole book. I conveniently had lent Gideon to a friend. I feel like that enhanced the experience somewhat because yeah. I was like, I just have to trust my memories of it, but I don't trust my memories of it. So that was like a fun <laughs> meta where, where I was like, what is happening? What's going on? Am I just insane? Yeah, getting the full experience. Because I was like, yeah. I can't just check. It really thrusts you into the Harrow POV. I feel like I should specify the reason that I have an obsession session with second person is because I read a 300,000 word Supergirl fan fiction when I was like 15 and it rewired my brain. I don't know why Soren. I remember you talking to me about this at like the age of 15. <laughs> I don't know why I oh, like you know what I think it was also a fan fiction. I think it was a critical role <laughs> fan fiction which I will not name for my own dignity. <laughs> I hadn't read second person until this one. I'm like, who is you? Like, who am I in this? Oh, I'm Harrow! <laughs> and then you get to that one chapter, three quarters of the way through the book. Yes. You see the word me, and you lose your entire f***ing sh- I need to say, I had that from, where is it? I was immediately like, second person is Gideon talking, right? The subtle making fun of Harrow and the knowledge of weapons. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is my second note for the whole book. <laughs> 
I was immediately like, this pommel stuff. No way. This is just Gideon. Mm-hmm. This is just Gideon speaking. I'm so mad I didn't pick up on that until the very end. And I was like, oh my God, of course it's Gideon. If you listen to the audiobook, the narrator Morgan Crick does such a good job of just subtly doing her Gideon Ooh. voice when she's narrating. And it's so good. Like, it's just enough that you'll notice on a second listen, but not the first one. Yeah, that makes so much sense because it comes through at times. Sometimes you kind of forget and then something will be particularly Gideon ish. Yeah, I know. Like, you were always a little bitch when you were angry. I'm like, oh. <laughs> All of her digs. Mm-hmm. That moment where she's like, ew, why are you kissing Yanthe? This is <laughs> disgusting. Yeah. I was like, yeah. Gideon, your biases are showing through so much right now. Mm-hmm. The whole book is a love letter and it just makes me absolutely go insane in my enclosure. I think Mo invented romance, actually. She did! In the most messed up possible way, but I love her for it anyway. The devotion of it all. I really love how also so many lesbian books are kind of like sanitized and like sexless in a way, but this one does not shy away from being creepy and wet <laughs> uh harrow wakes up from a coma uh after doing brain surgery on herself for her girlfriend gets stabbed through the hand has an orgasm because of it and then makes out with the ante. as you do <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> And then freaking Tamsin proceeds to write a regrowing a skeletal arm like a sex scene. I'm like, okay, sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was very um, erotically charged. It really was. But I'm like, you know what? I can see why. <laughs> They're so bad for each other. They are. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, I can't believe the sharing the bed scene. The use of tropes in general. <laughs> so good. The barista. <laughs> Barry Star. Yeah. I didn't get that the first time I read it. I just completely (laughs) missed it. I was losing my mind. Oh, and I love the return of Camilla because she's my special girl. I love her. Her lovely autistic girl dry humor of, I saw your corpse. Well, don't tell everybody because they'll want to see it too. <laughs> like, it's so good. That was such a good introductory line. It was such a relief to see Camilla after I know. being gaslit for 350 pages or whatever it was. And then to finally see that she was alive for her to come in on such a great line was just the pinnacle of my existence. I was so happy. I love her. The only competent one in this entire series. Genuinely. Getting to see characters again, because I was just like, well, they're dead. Mm. So I don't know why, because when I think about it, like, God resurrected literally all of humanity. Yeah. Of course, they're going to play around a little bit with the boundaries of life and death. Mm Mm-hmm. But I was very relieved to hear from everybody again. And new people, because we actually got to meet Dulcimea and her cavalier. Oh yeah, Dulcie, she's so sweet. I love her. She's so sweet. And also she got to say that she was horny for revenge, which was a great line. When you read the first book, you're like, oh, Abigail and Magnus. And then you read Harrow and you're like, Abigail and Magnus? I love them! I care about them so much. And Ortis? Yeah! Ortis is one of my favourite characters after this book because he's so pathetic and I love him. This is very embarrassing, but my one exceptional lesbianism is in this and it is Augustine. (laughs) I love that old man so much. (laughs) I don't know why it's him. Is this a good segue for favorite characters? I love Camilla as always. She'll always be my fave. It was very nice to meet Augustine, but also Commander Wake. Like, MILF of the Myriad, truly. Who is named after an m and M's. So good! But I didn't even know how to respond to that at that point. Like, you're already so thoroughly losing your mind, and then she just sneaks in a reference. Mm-hmm. Also, the Meat at the Cat reference was at, like, a similar <laughs> point of, like, intense... Jail for yeah. mother. <laughs> that was not the context I was expecting to hear it. Camilla and Harrow are such special faves to my mm. heart. Like, I will love them till the day I die. But for this book specifically, I don't know. I love Abigail so much. Mm-hmm. But I really like Augustine and Mercy, but only in the last 50 pages with their, like, yeah. really f- up relationship yeah. mm-hmm. bury me in that unmarked grave next to you that was so good absolutely going feral but then i also really love autis and the fact that he knows harrow so well and harrow knows his poetry off by heart so i know <laughs> she's lying about how much she hates poetry <laughs> but like there's that moment where he accepts culpability for the fact that he was a full-grown adult mm-hmm and he saw what Harrow and Gideon were going through all their childhood and did nothing about it. Recognition of the fact that their childhoods were really traumatic and f***ed up was so important. Honestly. But then I also love the body. She's just out here chilling, tea posing in the background at all times. Yeah. I really don't want to draw a family tree of like Harrow and Gideon and Gideon's. <laughs> 
dad and Operation Jizz Heist at a time. I can't believe that stealing God's sperm was such a major plot point in this novel. <laughs> I did suspect it. I didn't actually write it down, so I can't prove to anyone. Mm-hmm. And actually, it was only partially my own genius and intellect. It was partially because I edited the Gideon episode. Mm. And I don't think I even left it in the episode because it just felt like a weird pause in the episode. But when I was like, isn't it funny that I thought the Gideon was God? You guys were both like, <laughs> taxidermy fox, stop PNG. <laughs> yeah, we were very quiet. Who are your favourite characters, sorry? I feel like Harrow has taken the crown here because we got to spend more time with her, which was lovely. And I was extremely pleased to see that she was so unhinged in her own head because that was the impression that I got, but obviously she tries to project that she's under control when she's not. And it was kind of obvious mm-hmm. that she wasn't from Gideon's point of view, but it's like very obvious that she's not in this. This entire book, she's just like a bedraggled wet cat. She is. <laughs> Any other favourite characters? I mean, I was so happy to see Powell. And obsessed with the fact that he was spending his time writing fan fiction on a wall. <laughs> like, same. <laughs> That's what I would be doing if I was stuck in that room. Absolutely. I mean, I loved the new characters. I mean, God. I really liked God. I feel like this is a controversial take. I really liked God. I know he did some problematic things, but he was fun. He was fun. Have you been told yet, Soren, that the Moira's casting for God is Taika Waititi? <laughs> no, that's perfect, though. I love that. <laughs> He's just some guy. <laughs> He's just some guy. It's really just some guy. I was into his crown, though. I would also kind of... I mean, obviously, I don't want to like wear real infant finger bones, but like it, it sounded like a look. Mm-hmm. I know, he was serving. <laughs> just the all black and the... like. Obviously, I'm biased towards that. Uh, our listeners mm-hmm. can't see me, so they're like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? <laughs> I've never seen this man wear anything colourful in his life. <laughs> <laughs> Only against my will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, pack it up, Ninth House. <laughs> I also... Mercy Morn is so ruthless. Like, oh my god, towards the beginning where she ties Harrow's spinal cord into a knot so she's paralyzed. I'm like, Jesus Christ, Mercy! I've read it four times, I think, and it makes me lynch every time. The visceral body horror definitely continues into this one. It's so well done. Possibly goes up somehow. Oh yeah, oh think yeah. It's possible, but great, cool, fine. As soon as you get necromancer POV, it gets horrifying. Segwaying off that, can we talk about the soup scene? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> my absolute favorite scene of all time i had seen you guys talking about the soup scene without any context for what it was and i was so i don't know what i was expecting but it definitely wasn't that <laughs> oh it's so good she's so powerful she's absolutely yeah. unhinged she's got six days of no sleep and she still manages to do that and they're like where'd you get the bones from she's like i sliced up my own tibia and put it in the soup they're like <laughs> um pardon <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny creative extensions of any magic system interesting applications of it and surprising applications of it this is like the perfect example of that yeah where you're like oh obviously oh my god what the hell when i was going through it i highlighted every time that soup is mentioned before the soup scene <laughs> a lot <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> the only thing they seem to eat on that station is soup and then when you have like yeah you just burn an onion and then add salt and i'm like girl that is not how you make soup <laughs> No wonder Harrow doesn't have any weight or muscle at the end and Gideon's like, what the hell is going on? But there were some calluses on those necromancers' hands and I was proud of you. <laughs> I know, and she's just like, you could have done some star jumps or like squats, it's that difficult. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I really don't think she could. No. She's recovering from amateur brain surgery and had her spinal cord tied to a knot. I would be flat on my for like months. And also hasn't slept in like, a year. <laughs> I have a question. The back, it says that they're gayer than ever. Are they gayer? I think yes. Yeah. Well, Yante and Harrow are. Gideon and Harrow, are they less gay? But also, is there anything gayer than like whatever the hell they had going on? That's true. Even if they didn't get to make out. There's Yante and Harrow going on. There's Harrow and Gideon going on. There's Pyrrha and Wake in the background. And Gideon Prime. And God having a threesome. I was in a coffee shop when I read the God threesome scene, and I was trying so hard not to laugh, not because the threesome was funny, but Harrow's absolute <laughs> horror. <laughs> And then Iante, who's seen that before, definitely on the third, and she's just like, old people should be shot. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> it's the fact that Harrow is so freaked out by Gideon Prime kissing Kitharea's corpse, and <laughs> but is fully in love with the tomb. <laughs> it's different when I do it. Because mine is a manifestation of my insanity, but also maybe not, whereas that's a real dead body. God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
I hope no one's listening to this episode having not read the book because <laughs> you know sometimes they're like, "Ah, oh, it'll basically make sense." And in this case, I think no. you're in the wrong place, buddy. If you if you've read the book, it still doesn't make sense. <laughs> This made me want to reread Gideon even more, mm-hmm. and also immediately want to reread this, which I always think is a great sign. Rereading this is so fun. Mm-hmm. Rereading Gideon after this, and now understanding that the moment that Kitharea sees Gideon, she knows exactly what happened to the Cavaliers, mm-hmm. oh. and that motivates all of her revenge. It makes so much more sense. And then reading this, tracking every time it's probably Pyrrha instead of Gideon talking, that's really fun. Yeah. The moment after the incinerator, Gideon doesn't open his eyes and tells Harry how to be safe from him. That's not Gideon. That's Pyrrha. Pyrrha's just so interesting because she's so maternal and also such a lesbian, but also lived in a man's body for so many years. The gender theory of it all. I was kind of annoyed that we only knew about her such a short period of time mm-hmm. because I would love to dig into that more. I'm hoping that she comes back. The fact that Abigail and Ortis know about the time bubble, for like most of the book, and they keep trying to push Harrow into admitting everything. Oh my god, the recurring, is this how it happens? This was just driving me. Is this how it happens? Oh my god. And I love, Abigail has like a line in here, Taro, I think you might be haunted. Just the idea of just being haunted by grief. I think it's also, I think it might be Abigail who said it. You made yourself her mausoleum. It's Magnus who says that. You're not waiting for her resurrection. You've turned yourself into her mausoleum. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolute insanity. Love is a revenant, Ianthe says earlier, and then Magnus talking about the dance card. And then when Harrow's like, maybe I'm not holding onto the dance card, maybe I'm saving the last dance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually losing my mind. I think some of my favorite parts of the book, though, are Wake's letters, Mm. because I love her as a character. She's so interesting. Her ideas on pregnancy, too, because she is a character who has relied so much on her physicality and warrior prowess. But for this mission, she had to inseminate herself. And it's not a child that she wanted. It's for Mm. a purpose. She even referred to baby Gideon as the bomb. The letters she leaves are just so well written. Like, in heaven, I'll remember your mouth when you roast down in hell. I think you'll remember mine. I'm like, (laughs) I see where Gideon gets her flair for the dramatics from, but (laughs) I love the Gideon and Pyrrha and Wake dynamic though. Um, It makes me insane. I can't believe I didn't spot before that there was still a Cavalier in there. Mm Mm-hmm. The musculature and the way that Gideon, in inverted commas, uses a sword, or just in even more inverted mm-hmm. commas, uses a sword. It was right there. Mm-hmm. And when he basically has the same moment as Harrow does of the, like, I am insane and having to admit yeah. that to Harrow. I sometimes forget and Harrow's like, I'm sorry. The foreshadowing in this book, it makes no sense until, like, three quarters of the way through and then everything clicks. That's mm-hmm. why you got to read these books is for the click, for that moment. yeah. Everyone in this book is so neurodivergent and mentally yeah, ill, and I love mm-hmm. them all. Should we talk about mental illness? Because, oh my god, this was really good. It was really good! It was very nice to see a character who has delusions and auditory and visual hallucinations be treated so well, which obviously makes a lot of sense considering it's something that Moe has gone through. Mm-hmm. But it's just so automatically villainized often. Like, Hara has such a special place in my heart with just how how she is, the way that she handles it, and to some extent, the way that other people handle it. Like, first half of this book, I was like, oh my god, Aanthe, this is great. She confirms for Hara when her delusions are real or not. And then I got to the second half of the book, and I was like, I can't trust anything she's ever said in her life. (laughs) When she gaslights her about the corpse under the bed, that was so upsetting. (laughs) Oh my lord. How does she do that? How could you do that? Because she's (laughs) Aanthe! I know that there's, like, other crimes in this book that are objectively worse. That is the worst. How do you look into someone's eyes and just... And meanwhile, John is just, like, trying to parent Harrow and, like, giving her these little check-ins with tea and biscuits. His, like, C-plus parenting is so bad. The dynamic of, like, John as the father of this, like, found family, but everyone else is, like, an unwilling hostage in this situation. I loved it so much. It was, like, the worst found family ever. We have mandatory family dinner and everyone shows up glaring at each other. <laughs> <laughs> and it's trying to murder each other openly. Yeah. This is such a weird segue, but I kind of noticed it in Gideon, but I noticed it more here. The way that Moir uses colour. Mm-hmm. I'm obsessed with it. And Morgan, actually both of you, because you both know more about classics than me, but it struck me as very Greek, like the wine dark sea thing. It's very like texture Mm. and association based. Ianthe says that Harrow's eyes are petals in a dark room at one point. 
Mercy Morn's hair gets described as dead flower colour. Mm-hmm. I was eating that up. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. There's a lot of moments where you're like, what colour is this supposed to be, babes? Like, yeah. It's not a colour. I love the description of Gideon's eyes too and how they're always just so warm, especially when you learn later how she's God's kid and all the symbolism that comes with the gold. A yellow that made you dizzy to behold, a bronzed hot animal yellow as amber as the inside of an egg. The atrocities I would commit to be able to write like that. Honestly, this is one of those books where I'm like, oh, I'm actively envious. I uh, I need to be able to do this. Mm-hmm. I'm so jealous. I'm so jealous. Every single line is mm-hmm. so sharp. Really innocuous things. At one point, a sword is getting slid out and it's described as like a silken wet whisper, I think. Yeah. Oh, that's, so, that's unnecessarily good. Mm-hmm. It's not even like a particularly important moment. I think in the first one, whenever they describe Camilla's movements, I love it. Like just like Camilla hecked off leash, which was like light traveling across water. I'm like, exactly. Mm-hmm. Of course it is. Do we want to talk favorite quotes? Okay, okay, okay. On your death, I'll make the very blood in your body arrows and spears. It's <laughs> so good. Ooh. You will still be beholden to me, even if you're dead. I don't even care. I will still make you my weapon. I'm like, Jesus. Beloved dead, hear your handmaiden. I loved you with my whole rotten, contemptible heart. I loved you to the exclusion of aught else. Let me live long enough to die at your feet. Mm. <laughs> also the parallel in the beginning where it's like you prepare to die with a lock team on your lips but your idiot dying mouth rounded up three totally different syllables and they were three syllables you did not even understand and then when Gideon's dying she's like I want to think of you but I can't they've like role reversed and it's <laughs> yeah that reminds me also right near the beginning but Harrow Hark Harrow who has 200 dead children Harrow who loved something that had not been alive for 10,000 years Harrow Hark not a Jesimus had always so badly wanted to live she had cost too much to die yeah god <laughs> can I take a very hard left turn and say also Ayanthe's ghoul on ghoul action joke was <laughs> I love a little <laughs> god <incredible. on> go. <laughs> I love everything that comes out of Mercy Morin's mouth also. What were you thinking? Oh, he's going to be furious, you egg! <laughs> you egg is my favourite. <laughs> the fact that she also says hiss when Harrow first meets her <laughs> out loud. You're an infant, hiss! <laughs> Such a queen. The characterization of everyone is just so, so yeah. fantastic. I know you skimmed over Ortis already, but Ortis, oh my god, I loved him. Mm-hmm. He felt like such a cipher in book one, and really kind of nobody felt like a cipher, so I was a bit surprised by that, but he's so not. So his little poem being what brings Matthias back, I'm absolutely obsessed. Mm-hmm. Also, Matthias being so mad that he's speaking in meter. That's yeah. pretty funny. <laughs> I love Matthias. Tamsin's right, she's just like, yeah, the meter Ortis writes and is so arduous and terrible to read. He's like, I'm reading it and I'm trying to pick up the rhythm. I'm like, I have yeah. no idea. <laughs> so what is is it even supposed to be? I want to read the Abigail poem now, though. Mm-hmm. Yes. This is very important to me. Where's the short story that's actually just the Abigail poem? Should definitely write like a Quintain or something. I think that's what they're called. <laughs> Calamities would write sonnets. We know this. He's the most romantic motherfucker around. You probably put one in the fan fiction. <laughs> How did this book end again? That's a great question. <laughs> Can we talk about the ending? Yeah. The epilogue is so... It gives you such a hint into the wider world without giving you anything. Mm -hmm. It feels so disconcerting to have things like Mm -hmm. traffic being mentioned after both of them have been very, like, bottle episode in very different ways. Like, the first one feels very traditional horror. You're trapped in the room with a thing. And then the second one's much more cosmic horror, but then it uses the spaceship so that you still have that feeling of being confined. But then this is so scary, almost. It's like you've developed an agoraphobia (laughs) over the course of the two books. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, like, the epilogue, it's written like it's supposed to be such a serene and nice time yeah. but you're terrified because you have Scary. no idea what's happening you have no frame of reference for it yeah i know you're just like that ah, sausages <laughs> exactly <laughs> we're not supposed to have meat besides people meat there are only snow leaks and eating people's fingers in soup that's the food <laughs> yeah <laughs> i have a very important question soren go for it who do you think are the person who went to work for her, the person who taught her, and the person who looked after her. Christ. That's a great question. I mean, the person who looked after her is Camilla, right? Like, I felt like that was, that's what I was reading it as, but now I'm doubting myself. I thought, I was wondering if it was all the same person, and it was just like a way of referring to her in different ways. I think that's how I read it. Who do you think it is? I'm not going to tell you. We, we know who it is. Oh, you guys know. Yeah, never mind. Okay, <laughs> yeah. well, never mind. I was, I, I, I'm assuming that I'm wrong based on the fact that you've asked this question, but oh, I think no. that's how I was reading it. Oh, I was assuming it was multiple titles for the same person rather than multiple people. But then you're right, it says that she looked for people, so obviously I'm just blind and can't read. Which is a great trait to have when you host a book podcast. <laughs> oh god, I don't know. So it's looked after her, taught her. And went to work. 
I mean, I'm assuming that it's a lot of Eden kiddos. So Corona and I don't know which one would be which though. So I don't know. Interesting. I don't think that's right. <laughs> you have to find out. I want to know your predictions for known. Oh wait, no, that would be your blind react. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can vaguely be like, I don't know what the hell. <laughs> It's going to be about. I would vaguely be like, maybe Nona is about whoever this is at the end of this book. But at the mm-hmm. same time, I feel like this, whoever this is, at least is probably still in Haru's body. And then I feel like the cover of Nona shows somebody else. There is a dog on the cover of Nona, and I appreciate it's a that. a dog, exactly. We've not had any animals, but we've had comparisons to animals before. Mm-hmm. Well, so they must exist. And we've had birds, I think. Mm-hmm. You were with me when I bought Nona, so you've seen me. We were literally wandering around London. I was just looking at it, like not looking where I was going, getting almost run over. I was trying really hard not to look at it, though. So I cried four times when I read it. Oh my god, I'm so scared. I also cry a lot, but still, <laughs> oh, it wrecked me. Should we do our final thoughts because we've been going for like oh yeah longer than I <laughs> we usually go for at all. Okay, well this book is my favorite of the series, and I gave all of them five stars, so this one also gets a five stars. But it just holds a very special place in my heart. The writing style and just the caliber that you can write queer sci-fi at, because it's very very literary and it's in a very pulpy genre, and I think that's really fun. This is also my favorite book of the series, and I just. I'm absolutely fair about it. Five stars across the board. Trying to explain it to someone who hasn't read it and like trying to convince people to read it and just being like, okay, it's such a fine balance of the most devastating thing you've ever read in your life and just really aggressive sex jokes. Mm -hmm. It is my favorite book. In the last one, I was like, I can't say this is my favorite book, but it is my favorite book of all time that I've ever read. It blows everything I've ever read out of the water. Yeah, I mean, obviously I haven't had the time to mull it over, but obviously this is five stars. It's so good. Is this the best thing I've ever read? Maybe. It's just so good (laughs) that I find myself completely Mm -hmm. lost for words. It's so, it builds so nicely on the first one. It's just got everything. It's got clever uses of the magic system. It's got cool cosmic horror. It's got really, really, really well realized good characters that feel so real that I am talking about them like an idiot, like they're real people. Like, (laughs) I care so much. Five stars. Do we have recommendations for people that enjoy Harry the Ninth? Oh, oh, this one's a weird one. Chouette by Clara Shetsky. It's magical realism. It's about a woman who gives birth to an owl baby. And it's got really, really interesting ideas about motherhood and pregnancy that I kind of saw reflected in Wake's whole arc. So if you wanted like a little bit of an expansion on that. And also with like the whole not knowing what's real and what isn't, there's a lot of that in Chouette also. If you like body horror and also mental illness and disability and main characters absolutely losing their mind over the course of the narrative, Hell Followed With Us by Andrew Joseph White. Yes! Yes! So good! Literally rewired my brain when I read it last week. Also, if you really love the (laughs) Catholic trauma that comes out (laughs) in Harry the Ninth, there's a lot of that in Hell Followed With Us. The one I was just going to recommend is far more Nona core. Well, actually, it's kind of, it's a little bit this one. It's Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. The body horror in it is very good. And it's also very, very isolated. The main character who has absolutely no clue what's going on. That was really fun. And her complete lack of ability to trust anybody around her is very harrow. Um, I don't have a book this time. I I tried to think of one and I failed. <laughs> but I was going to, I'm just tossing out, go read some Derek C. Brown poetry if you liked Harry the Ninth. Mm. Church of the Broken Axe Sandal for some like visceral religious trauma with lots of body horror imagery and weirdness and a finger two dots then me for immortality and soulmates Mm. but like in a weird way and like humanizing God in an interesting way. I've never found any of his collections in the UK but I found him online. Go go read his stuff it's online so or you can hear it actually it's better spoken word so go 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 on YouTube listen to it it's great. Is that the whole podcast? I think so. What do we usually do? Yeah, um, we have to say next time. Wait, no, no, we need to say thank you to Zoe for being amazing. Thanks for having me. It was really good. This was so fun. I was so excited to record with you again. This was so good. Oh, it was so yeah. fun. Oh, I, I love this book. and I, I like talking about it on this podcast. It's very fun. <laughs> do you have anything to plug? Oh, God. Well, my list list stuff from last time is still kicking around. MJ plugged our horror podcast that we're co-producing. I don't know what I am and I'm not allowed to talk about because uh, MJ is the ideals girly and I'm the admin girly. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that's a thing that's happening. Oh, 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 actually, 
I do have a thing I have to plug. Um, Trentologies and Room 56 are both up for Audioverse Awards. And um, I think voting will be closed by the time this episode is out. <laughs> voting will be closed. But Trentology Season 2 will be coming up in June. Are we all ready for it? Yes, we are all involved in that. Next month is a little bit of a joke. We wanted to do Evelyn Hugo. And so I, as a joke, but kind of seriously, said... Why don't we do Evelyn Hardcastle as well? So we are starting off our aptly titled Evelyn Month with the seven and a half deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton. But until then, you're always welcome through the bookcase. Don't forget to scratch the cat on your way out. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Bookcase, a production of Plain Up Rod. On this episode, you heard Zoe Davis, Morgan Greensmith and Soren Brier were discussing Harry the Ninth by Tamsin Ware. You can find out more about the Locked Tomb series at publishing.tor.com slash author slash Tamsin Ware, and you can follow him where at Tasmware on Twitter. A huge, huge thank you to Zoe. It was so much fun having you on the show again. You can find out about upcoming horror drama Whitman and Sons on Twitter at Whitman Sons Pod, and all about trans anthology show Tranthologies and small town horror show Children from 56 on the Listless Network website at listless.ga. You can find out what Zoe's up to on Instagram at zoe.lav or on Twitter at zoe underscore lav. You can also find these links in the show notes. You can find The Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase and on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Planar Prod at planarprod.com. Know what we should read next or want to chat to us about what we thought of this episode's read? You can reach us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com or send us a DM on social media. We'd love to hear from you. If you're enjoying The Hidden Bookcase, please consider leaving us a rating or review or you can always tell a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for bookworms to discover our show. April is Evelyn Month at The Hidden Bookcase. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, the 3rd of April, we'll be discussing The Seven, or Seven and a Half, Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through The Bookcase.